If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Very familiar passage of scripture for many of you, but maybe you've never heard it before. Luke chapter 6. And I'll read one passage of verse, one verse of this passage. Luke 6 and 38. Simply says, give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Today I will be talking on the subject of giving. Simply giving. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus and we thank you for the privilege that we have of what you did. We're able to come together in a homogenous group, Lord, to gather together in such a way to worship you and to lift up our hands in freedom without wrath and without the government coming down upon us. Lord, we're able to, to call on the name of Jesus, your son, and we're able to gather in this place and freely demonstrate how we feel about you. Help us to understand it's all because of what you did on the cross, how that you gave to us that we're able to do what we're doing right now. For you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let an everlasting life be released in this place, God. Everywhere we go, let us go with the spirit of expectancy of what you're going to do in others' lives. Allow us to walk with you, God, through the dark places that we know that there's light at the end of the tunnel. For, Lord, we're not at the end, but, Lord, we're even at the very precipice and the edge of what you're going to do to this world. We ask that, God, we would enjoy it as we go along this journey with you. Help us to have a spirit of giving in this place. And we thank you and we honor you in Jesus' name. Can you say in Jesus' name? Go ahead and put your hands together one more time. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. And thank you for standing so long. Don't worry. You can hold on to your wallets. <laughs> I'm not setting you up. I'm just preaching what the Lord would have me to do during this season and this time of giving. In this time of giving, many people around the world are going to uh, take time out and pause and give to different areas uh, such as ministries and charities and even just going out and doing something different that they've never done for anyone before. Even within the households, not every household, but many households, will, they'll be having exchanging of gifts and, and giving to one another in their appreciation, maybe for what they've been to them during the year or just because they're family members or maybe because they've never done it before. But there's going to be that spirit of giving. Everyone say giving. There's going to be a spirit of giving that just kind of sweeps across not only our nation but around the world because Americans are not the only ones that celebrate Christmas, but Christmas is celebrated all around the world and it just generates a spirit of giving. Why? Because of, again, what the Lord did for us on that cross. Can you say amen? <laughs> Dr. Charles Stanley wrote, the world attaches far more significance to money than God ever intended them to have. Instead of simply being a means of exchange of goods and services, it has become an object of greed, a source of power and prestige, and a means of achieve, achieving status, happiness, and security. With so many false hopes pinned to wealth, he goes on to say, we must be careful not to fall for the lies. Scripture not only warns us that placing too much importance on money is dangerous, it also advises us to have to uh, advises us how to use wealth according to God's purposes. Everyone say God's purposes. Amen. According to uh, Jim Sammons, God has basically four purposes for money. That's not going to be the main subject, but I do want to bring this up. Four purposes of money. This is something in the basic uh, 
uh, institute or something, Bill Gothard's Institute, that I learned maybe almost 30 years ago. And it's a principle that I applied to my life when I first heard it. But I just want to kind of rehearse what Jim Salmon said in that. He said, God's first purpose for money is to provide for our basic needs. Therefore, having, as the scriptures says, having food and raiment, every, having food and clothes to put on our backs. Let us be there with content. Uh, in other words, anything above food and clothing is, in God's eyes, considered a blessing or above what you basically need. As long as I have something to put on my back to give me shelter and I have food or sustenance to put in my stomach so that I can be able to function and live to the next day, I need to be grateful for what God is doing. Amen. God's second purpose for money is to confirm direction in our lives. In other words, learning how to wait upon the Lord and saying, Lord, I won't move until you move me. I won't do what, you, what I, I want to do until you confirm uh, what you want me to do. Uh, and one of those ways that God confirms uh, direction in your life is that he will give you the finances to do what you're supposed to do. In other words, uh, if you want a brand new car and you say, I need this car. Well, you need a car because you need transportation, uh, but you want this brand new 19, uh, or I mean, eight, now it's 2018 uh, or 2019 uh, or whatever it is they're making now. A 2000 model, I need this vehicle to be able to get where I'm going. And God gives you a 1969 bug. Because your money is funny. And your change is strange. <laughs> That's all you can afford. I remember one time I needed a car, and I was in Bible college, and I needed a car. I really needed one, but I didn't ask for one. I asked God for one, and I came to Bible college with the Corvette paid off and everything, Stingray. It was fully paid off, but I ended up selling that just to pay for my bill because the military wasn't coming through with the funds to pay for school I needed, and I ended up selling that vehicle. Didn't want to sell it, but I sold it just to stay in school because I knew it was the will of God for me to be in school, and I sold that car, and I was without a car for a while, and then I needed a vehicle to get back and forth to work and to go where I was going. And, and my boss came up to me and said, do you need a car? I said, yeah, I need a car. He said, I'm going to give you my car. And I said, no, I'm not going to take your car. I don't need your car. I said, don't give me your car. He said, no, I'm getting ready to buy a brand new car, and I want to give you my car. I said, well, I'm not going to take your car from you. I didn't even feel good about taking a car from a man who's not regenerated, and, and, and I don't want him to think that, you know, I'm, because I'm a Christian that I'm expecting anything from him. And so he, he said, no, I want to give you this car. And I said, no, 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 I can't take that car from you. And he said, well, well I'll, I'll sell it to you. And I said, how much do you want for the car? He said, I'll sell it to you for a dollar. I said, that sounds like a good deal to me. So I bought the car for a dollar. Now you would have thought that it was an up-to-date car, but it was a hoopty. It was a Nova. And it was old, and it had a hole in the floor in the back. And, and you know, you could put your feet and dangle at the back if you really wanted to and scrape the ground. But the car ran good. And I was very grateful. We kept that car all the way through Bible college, right, babe? We were so proud of that car. We, you know, that car took us everywhere we wanted to go. We took it to Disneyland. No problem. Now, now, if I was kind of arrogant and, and too proud to take the car, I would have said, no, you know, that's okay, that car, no, I don't want that car. I thought you had something else in mind. Kind of like the guy that he was uh, on the street and he needed some food, and I went up to him and I said, uh, are you hungry? He said, yeah, but I want this and only that. Said, well, you're not that hungry, man. <laughs> See, sometimes we come to God with these preconceived ideas of what we want. And money at times will confirm direction of what God wants to do in your life. And then you need to be so thankful because all things work together for the good to them that love God, to those that are the call according to his purpose. God's third purpose for money is to illustrate his power. This is the only place in the Bible where God challenges us to test him. In other words, God says, prove me therewith and see if I will not when it comes to giving. When it, in, in nowhere else in the Bible, he doesn't ask you to test him. He doesn't ask you to pressure him. But there's this only one place in the Bible where God says, test me and see if I will not. And it's all about giving. And so I'm trying to change someone's pers uh, perspective and their thoughts about giving so that as you go into 2018, that you have a different mindset, not so that everyone else would be able to benefit from you, but that your life and everything that God is doing in your life will come to its optimum. It will go over and beyond that God will just break every yoke and every fetter, every chain that's on you and your family and even on your lineage in Jesus name. 
God's fourth purpose for money is to give to others such as Christians, the poor, and even the support of the church itself. Keep in mind that although the giving of our time and talents is very important and we should give of our time and our talent, the scripture overwhelmingly highlights the way we manage money. Everybody say manage money. It's just talking about stewardship. According to one leadership article, 16 of 38 parables were concerned with how to handle money and possessions. In the Gospels, an amazing one out of 10, that's 10%, ironically, 10%, 10 verses out of 288 in all direct, are directly deal with the subject of money. The Bible offers 500 verses on prayer, less than 500 verses on faith, but more than 2,000, 2,020, 2,300 to be exact uh, on money and possessions. So there's an overwhelming abundance, uh, a preponderance, if you will. There's an overabundance of information given throughout Scripture from the Old Testament to to the New on how we should manage money and what we should do with the possessions that God has given us and allowed us to steward over. Why? Well, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, Jesus gives us the reason why. He said, for where your treasure is, everybody say my treasure. The things you value. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Meaning your mind and who you really are. Your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions. So wherever I plant my treasure or I give my valued substances, that is where my heart will be as well. You see, God wants wants our hearts, not our treasure. But he also realizes that it is impossible for him to have our hearts without freely giving him our treasure because our hearts are directly connected to our treasure. You cannot separate the two according to Jesus. Therefore, the Lord wants us to freely and cheerfully. Everybody say cheerfully. Cheerfully. Because he loves a cheerful giver. It does you no good to have a frown on your face as you begin to minister to someone on the street and say, here, go ahead and take this. (laughs) You know, we were out doing an outreach. We called it Urban Warfare years ago. And Urban Warfare, we were going to the hot spots. And and I got it from my old military training, my old SWAT team training on, on actually doing, I was good at Urban Warfare. I was a team commander for Urban Warfare and how to go into a, a particular in, uh, situation and deal with hot situations. Uh, and, and being the team commander for that, we, we had to go in in a certain way and deal with the things that were the most dangerous. Uh, and so this Urban Warfare was kind of patterned after that to where we would go in Stockton, the most dangerous places in Stockton, whether or not they were having a shooting or stuff going on. We would go there, set up. And in the beginning, we would uh, have camouflage on, but then a lot of folks would thought we were cops and we come in there <laughs> they said are you cops no we're not cops man we're church you know so and we come in here but then the music is going and we had clothing and everything out there and just giving everybody something and I remember one urban warfare we we're at a park and I'm sitting there and I saw this guy with no shoes on the Lord said give him your shoes so I took my shoes off while I was there I said I had some you know kind of like uh good walking shoes and I took those shoes off and I walked over and said here man I need to get some shoes for you and then he looked and he said where's your shoes at I said those are my shoes I said I'm giving them to you he said no you don't have to do that and I said no you need them more than I need them I have another pair of shoes at home as they're going to take these shoes now it would have been here here's the deal it would have been one thing to do that but it would have been another thing for me to walk up to him with a frown on my face my face all messed up because I'm feeling like God wants me to go the extra mile and give somebody my shoes and and I go up there here take these shoes What good is that? He loves a cheerful. Everybody say cheerful. Cheerful Cheerful giver. This was the spirit of the early church. The early church, do you know, if you've never read it, read the beginning of the early church in the first century. The first century church, when they came to the Lord, they gave everything they had. I'm not recommending this, but they took all the things that they had, their houses and everything. They sold everything and they came and laid at the apostles' feet. 
This was called communism. This is how communism actually had its roots. And they began to give everything they had, and they had a common pot, and then they began to distribute out of that common pot. That's not something that we want to follow today, but I'm just showing you the spirit in which the early church had. They said it all belongs to God anyway, so we're going to give it all to the church. We're going to give it all, and it's going to be distributed. That Everyone that has need will be met. There's something about uh, when you're not bound by things, that things no longer dictate what you do. You begin to just freely let them go and cheerfully let them go. Maybe Psalm 24 and 1 will help put things in perspective. It says this, uh, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all they that dwell therein. All the inhabitants, uh, all the people, everybody belongs to God anyway and everything you see belongs to God anyway. Amen. Scripture Timothy says it like the Paul told Timothy like this. He said, you know, you didn't bring anything in this world. You came in naked. I saw a little baby back here that we may dedicate next month. And this little baby, when that baby was born, did it have clothes on? No. Didn't have any clothes. Did it have a watch on? No. Did it have money in his pockets? Didn't even have pants to put money in, right? Came in naked as a, I don't know where you get this term, as a jaybird. Take it as a jaybird. I'm dating myself. Look, Paul told Timothy, you didn't bring anything in this world, and it is certain. If you didn't think that was good, he said, it is certain you will not carry anything out of this world. So the car that you have, the clothes that you have, and the wife that you have, and the husband you have, it's going to belong to somebody else when you leave. <laughs> Yes, she will remarry. <laughs> You're not taking it. I'm not taking it with me. So I learned a long time ago to let go and not allow possessions to rule my life. It all belongs to God and everything in it, even human beings. That's why you don't even leave with the body that you have. The body stays right here. And, and we get a, a glimpse of this. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we get a glimpse of this when he says, I am not my own anymore. I'm bought with the price. Therefore, I will glorify God in my body and in my spirit, which belong to God. The world doesn't understand that concept, but when you become a born-again believer, what happens is your spirit gets born again and an enlightenment comes in. You recognize some things and the word of God comes alive to you and it becomes your roadmap. And it says, we're not our own anymore. We're bought with the price, the blood of Jesus Christ. We're bought with the price. Therefore, my, my gratitude is this. Uh, I'm going to give him my body and I'm going to give him my spirit. It's going to belong to him. I'm going to freely give it to him. Can you say Amen. Notice what God declared in Haggai chapter 2, verse 8. He said, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. Everything belongs to God. We are, we, 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 once we realize that we are simply managers of God's stuff and not owners, it may change our approach to giving in all these areas. It will change the way we deal with people that we see in need. It will change the way we deal with our family as we provide for them. It will change the way we deal with the church. It will change the way we deal with anybody that comes our way. And God says, I'm moving on you to do something about the situation. See, it's one thing. I, I was, I was um, reading up on giving and everything, and I saw this article. And one of the articles says that, and, and, and we use this, my wife and I use this in our home pretty much, and it's talking about the frontal lobe. And the frontal lobes have this ability to make, help you to make, the more developed they are, to help you to make good decisions. Decision, when you see a young person that hasn't had a fully developed frontal lobe, in other words, it takes about 25 years, they say, for that frontal lobe, lobe to be fully developed to where they can make good decisions. That's why young kids jump off of roofs and people like myself think about it and say, I'm not jumping off this roof. <laughs> I could die. A young person says, catch me if you can. And jump on the mattress, you know, that's only this high off the ground. The frontal lobe is not developed. But when it comes to giving, they made a, had a study. And one of the studies showed that the people that had fully developed frontal lobes did not give as much. They noticed that in America, there was about 2% of people throughout America that give to charities. 
And they attributed that to them having fully developed frontal lobes. Fully developed frontal lobes make decisions and say, you know, that's important, that's important, that's important, and that's not that important. And they say people that give the most and they're just overly and overtly giving, it says that their frontal lobe is not as developed because they don't value money. In other words, they don't feel money is the best thing and and they begin to do things differently. And why does God choose to override the frontal lobes, because he does it and helps you to understand that when you give, it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and run. There's a, a principle that is overriding the natural man. The natural man says, this doesn't make sense uh, for me to provide for other people and take care of other people, even when I don't have a whole lot. To, but there's something about the power of God uh, and the word of God that when you obey it, uh, you begin to see the results uh, of what it says that's going to come about. It goes again the tide of the natural man. Paul said the natural man cannot receive the things of the spirit because there are foolishness unto him because they are spiritually discerned. Amen. I would like to point out three positive effects of giving. Number one, the first positive effect of giving is that the master of your life will be identified. Jesus sat against the treasury, and the Bible says he observed how men gave. And he watched the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the rich and the poor. He watched everyone, but he saw, and I've said it before, he saw the woman that only had two mites, and she gave. And he said to his disciples, see this woman? She gave more than them all because she gave all that she had. She may not have had a whole lot, but she gave what she had with a cheerful heart and the right spirit. And he observes how we give. The, the master of your life will be identified. Notice what he said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. I'm reading from the Amplified. He says, no one, speaking of Jesus, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. He says, you cannot, in other words, it's impossible You cannot serve God and mammon, money, possessions, fame, status, or what is valued more than the Lord. So there's this this battle about things that I have or do the things have me. There's this battle as to what am I going to serve? And when we give, it's going to identify who is the master of my life. If I'm chintzy and I I feel like, "Eh," you know, God knows what's in your heart. Do you remember Ananias and Sapphira in the very beginning of the church? Thank God he's not doing that today. He may be, but I'm, I haven't seen it. But Ananias and Sapphira saw all the church giving everything that they had and, and all that. And so Ananias and Sapphira went out and sold this property, right? And they said, we're going to give it all. They just made it public. We're going to give it all to the work of God. But when it came time to give it, they thought about it. And they conspired between themselves. And they said, oh, let's give a portion. So they gave that portion, which was a large portion. But they came and gave it. And the Holy Ghost spoke and spoke to one of the apostles. And they said, uh, why is... And, and when the husband came and, and, and got before the apostles, the apostle asked him, why is it that Satan has filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Is that what you sold it for? And he said, yes, that's what I sold it for. He said, you're, you're dead. And then the guy dropped dead. Bam! Oh! So his wife come in, you know, Polly Purebred. She's coming later. <laughs> he said, I got one question to ask you. Is, is that the whole amount you guys sold it for? And she said, oh, yes. That's what we said. He said, you know, the same guys that drug your little crusty husband out, they're here to pick you up too. <laughs> and she dropped dead. One of the things he said to them was, look, while it was yours, you could have done with it whatever you wanted. You didn't even have to give it all. But you said you gave it all so that you can get the praise of people. It isn't that God wants to clean out your bank account and that God wants to bankrupt you. As a matter of fact, he doesn't want to do any of that. But God wants you to have a heart of thanksgiving. He wants you to have a heart of giving. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. He wants you to be in that mode, uh, not just at Christmas time, uh, but all throughout the year so that he can bless your home and overflow everything that's in your house. Everything. 
It's his principle. His principles, they work. But you will be able to identify the master. It will be identified in your life. Number two, another positive effect of giving is the blessings of God will be unleashed in your life. I'm a personal testimony of that. The, by I attribute it to giving through lean times and through abundance. It really didn't matter to me. When we didn't have, we did. And when we had, we did. It's something about the principle and the blessings. And, and, and it's kind of like an oxymoron because it says, give, expecting nothing in return. Okay. And then it says, if you give, I will pour out. It's an oxymoron. I mean, how did both abide? Well, you come with an attitude of saying, Lord, I'm not doing this to get, but there's a principle of sowing and reaping. There's a principle of planting and, and, and seeing the harvest come in. There's something that's there, and God, whenever you choose to do it, I'll take it. It may be that you're giving money, but God's going to bless your family. It may be that you're giving a clothing to someone, but God is going to allow someone in your life to be healed. You don't know where the blessing is going to come in, but I guarantee you, and I seen it that God has been able to do more and exceedingly abundantly above all than I can ever ask or even think that's how he works in verse 38 of our scripture text Jesus said give and it shall be given unto you notice good measure this means in a large portion Pressed down, meaning compacted. In other words, like a jar, he's saying like this, uh, and you put this big old jar, but then I want you to take what you're going to put inside there, and I want you to press it down. Why? So you can get more in there, pressed down, compacted, uh, and then I want you to shake it together. In other words, if I'm going to pour sand in there, that sand is going to go in between what you put in there, and it's going to fill it even more. I want you to shake it together and let that sand go all the way down into the bottom, and then it's going to begin to run over. It's going to overflow. This is what's going to happen in your life. This is what Jesus said. Uh, he said, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. How? Shall men give into your bosom? Uh, and in the bosom he's talking about is not just your chest, uh, but he's talking about his robe. Uh, that means take your robe uh, and lift it up. Uh, and you might see your underwear, but lift up your robe. I didn't think he thought about that. <laughs> but they were wearing breeches. Shorts under their underwear. And then fill that up. And as much as you can get in there, if you really believe and you trust God, and it's running over, he said that men shall give into your bosom for with the same measure or portion that ye meet or that you give with all, it shall be measured or portioned to you again. So what I would do is get one of those big floundering skirts and just pull it right out and say, Lord, fill that thing up right now. I need the blessing of the Lord, but I'm not doing it for that. But I know that your principle is true. And, God, I, and that's how generous he wants us to be with the people all around us, to the poor, to our families to the church, to everything that God puts in our heart to do. The Lord said in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, in the Amplified, he said, bring all the tithe, the tenth. That's what the word tithe, tithe means, tenth. Into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. And he said, test me, prove me, try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you so great a blessing until there is no room to receive it. How many need that kind of blessing in your life? And he's just saying that's just, just by, by bringing in the tithe, 10% of your income that comes in or your crops or whatever it is that you do and, and bringing 10% of that and just laying it at, at, the, at the church and, and for the support of the ministry and all that. He said by that alone, he's going to open the windows. And I've talked to people. I remember uh, one of my, my um, 
students in my Sunday school class back when I first got saved and, and I started teaching Sunday school. One of my students, he used to sit at my feet and, and everything. He was just there. He was, he, was good. he was intelligent. He was way more intelligent than I was as a young person. And he was just there. He just sucked in and, and just took the word in. I mean, everything I taught him, he just was there. He was right there. He ended up coming to Bible college. He ended up coming out of Bible college, going into seminary and everything. And then he was, became a writer and he started writing books and he brought me his first book. He said, read this book. Come on. <laughs> I read the title. <laughs> Why men should not tithe. <laughs> he got too smart. So I read it, and he said, what do you think? I said, heresy. <laughs> he said, heresy. I said, yeah, boy, that's heresy. What do you... I've heard the old arguments, I've heard all this, and we can, I can uh, debate you all day on it, but here's the bottom line. It has everything to do with your heart. God's not asking you to tithe. God is saying, give everything. God is saying, I want every bit of you. It belongs to me. And this is what the early church understood. And when you understand that the tithe is a very small portion, it's just a little thing. It just helps. It just puts things in perspective. And so that's heresy to believe that I'm going to keep all this and and, and whatever I decide, I'm going to do. That's where the problem is. No, Lord, whatever you decide, you want me to do. And usually it goes far and beyond the minimum. Amen. Amen. Solomon said in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 through 10, New Living Translation, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part, not the last, but the best part of everything you produce. And then, he uses this word here, this conjunction, it says, Then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats with overflow with good wine. In other words, the principle drawn from here is that God says that when you get this spirit about you of giving, and, and it, it's just part of the way you live, then he will always cause everything around you to prosper. It doesn't mean there won't be times where it's tough. It doesn't mean that, because I've been through tough times. But it does mean that God will not leave me without recourse. God is our provider. He will provide all my need according to his vault in heaven, according to his riches in heaven, according to what he has there. And so we always bring it and we always do right. Even when we don't have to give, we would see someone that has less than we have and we would give. God is good. Number three and final, another positive effect of giving is The enemy of your soul will lose his financial power over you. Somebody needs that today. The Lord goes on to say in Malachi chapter 3 verse 11, By giving I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. There's somebody in this place right now that needs the enemy, the monkey, to get off of your back and to lose his grips on your finances and on the prosperity of your household and everything that God wants to do in your life. And it's directly relinked and related to the way that we give. Giving will cause and the proper understanding of why I'm giving uh, and how I'm giving uh, and the spirit that I'm giving uh, and giving without a a motive and giving cheerfully and understanding that this is how God redeemed mankind. Uh, This is how he got the grips of sin off of our back. It didn't come by just doing everything perfect by the law. The way he got the monkey, the devil, off of our backs and out of our lives and out of our spirit and out of our soul and get our souls out of hell is that he sent his son Jesus Christ to die on a cross he gave his only begotten son that he can break the grips of of the devil he can break the grips of hell and the grave it's no surprise that he used giving to do that and he's saying I will rebuke the devourer For your sakes, I will cause 
your flocks and your herds and, and your vineyards and your vats and everything you have around you to begin to prosper in our vernacular. He will cause everything that's in your house uh, not to break down. Uh, he will cause everything that you're, you're driving to do longer and go longer. He will cause your children uh, to prosper. He'll make sure that there's food in your house to eat uh, and you'll be able to have enough to get by to the next day. He's going to do all that uh, because the enemy will just have his grip loosed off you. I think it's worthy of saying right now that when we first started in ministry 22 years ago, and I've said it before many times because it was very uh, meaningful to us, where different ones of this congregation, and when we were, you know, I was working full-time ministry. When the Lord called me into ministry, he told me to go full-time into ministry, and full-time for me in ministry was at that time $300 a month. Okay? Who can live on $300 a month? There you go. You learn to manage money. And, and, and so then I started teaching martial arts, and that's what I do. And I started, opened up a couple of schools and, and did that, and that kind of supplemented. But I've, I've, I'm not, I've never did it for money. I always did it. I could charge a lot of money because most martial arts schools, they don't. They're kind of like, yeah, whatever, commercial. And, but I always charged so that the kid that did, couldn't ever learn, and they wanted some real good Olympic-level martial arts training, that they can get it from someone that knows what they're doing. So I always charge 25. Sometimes I went down to 15. Sometimes it was free and up to at the most $30 a month. And I would train kids and, and adults and different ones. And so I didn't make hardly anything there. And so there was the, the meaningful time was when some of you would come by and bring food over to our house. We looked healthy. We, we had everything we needed pretty much. But there were a couple of times when we needed different things. And the Holy Ghost supernaturally moved on you to do that. Yeah. And, and, I'm, and I'm telling you, it, it meant a lot. And I, we attribute that to being faithful over a little, and then God eventually made us faithful over a lot. And so you, if you get to the point to where you're saying, well, Lord, I don't have anything. He's just saying, look, you just be faithful over what you have and be cheerful over what you have and give what you can. And I'm telling you, as you begin to go on, you're going to have that same spirit no matter how high you go. Amen. Let's all stand. I believe the Lord wants to do something in the lives of someone here today. And so I'm going to give an altar call, and I want you to listen very carefully as I give this altar call. And it's for those who need something from God. Maybe you need to become the master, let the Lord become the master of your lives. Maybe that's you today. You're needing him to be the master, ruler, Lord over everything in your life. And when you come to this altar, that's why you're coming. Maybe you need God to meet your basic everyday needs. He said, I will supply them all. But you need God to prove himself here. And you're making up your mind that I'm going to be a giver because I'm going to, I'm going to let him meet my needs. And maybe you need to have your God confirm direction in your life. You need direction. He's going to show you that through giving. Or maybe you need to show you need God to show his mighty power in circumstances that are going on, which are a plethora of things in your life. Circumstances. I need God to show himself strong. Or maybe you need to be blessed in excess because you believe God has called you to be a gifted giver to this world, to everyone around you, but you need to be blessed in excess. And maybe you're in this category. You need Satan's grip to be broken off of your finances. It's been generational, but you're going to turn it around. Maybe whatever category you're in, a master, basic needs, excess, maybe you need God's power to be in your circumstances, maybe you need direction in life, or you just want Satan's grip broken totally and completely. Come, stand at the altar with me. Haramoshatara. We're going to pray here in just a minute. And as we pray, here's what I would ask you to do. Just close your eyes. Focus on the Lord. And here's what you need to commit. 
not what you don't have, but what you do have. And say, Lord, I am going to faithfully try to, because you may mess up, but I'm going to try to faithfully manage everything that you've given me. I may be at the homeless shelter, but I'm going to faithfully manage this cot, this coat, these shoes, this comb in my hair. I'm going to faithfully manage the two cents I have in my pocket or the lack thereof. Lord, I'm going to faithfully manage everything around me from here on, and I'm going to try and do my best. And then all these other areas that you have come in here with, God is going to deal with. He said it like this. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we ask you to do the work that only you can do by the power of the Holy Ghost. Uh, there are men and women standing here in front of me. Uh, there are young people, God, that have come uh, and they need something from you. Uh, but God, they're making a commitment uh, to be followers of you uh, and be stewards uh, over the things that you've given them in their lives. Uh, Lord, there are some that are in here that have, a mu have much uh, and there are some that have little. There are some that have nothing uh, and there are some that have an abundance. Uh, but God, we want to be directed uh, by what to do with what you've given us. Uh, so we give it all back to you uh, and we want to manage it well so that you can get the most out of our lives. Uh, Lord, break every grip and stronghold uh, that's on my brothers and sisters. Uh, allow them to be a blessing and not a curse. Uh, allow them to be able to see all their needs uh, met uh, by the, God, the one who gave them what they have now and that is life uh, and that more abundantly. Lord, uh, in the name of Jesus, uh, Lord, every stronghold uh, that the enemy has set up uh, on the finances of people under the sound of my voice. I command them to be broken in the name of Jesus. You said you would break them. And Lord, you said you would open the windows of heaven. God, you said you would give. If we give, it shall be given back to us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Shall men give into our bosom. I pray in the name of Jesus that you'll loose, Lord God, your word upon us. And God, we would receive everything that you have already declared in our lives. In in the name of Jesus, Lord, not only for us, not only for our children and our children's children, for everyone who comes around us. In the name of Jesus, let us have the word of life. We're not preaching a message to blab it and grab it, spit it and get it, but Lord, we're saying, Lord, we want to obey the principles of the word, and in the principles of the word, there's a blessing that comes with it. In the name of Jesus, Lord, begin to add unto men and women as they give themselves fully to you in the name of Jesus as they give their heart as they give their mind as they give their spirit as they give everything to you Lord now direct them now just begin to talk to them now be pour into their life open up windows and gates and doors and allow them to see in their circumstances what they need to do in the name of Jesus put in their mind oh God strategies and Lord plans for success in every area let the Holy Ghost be let down in this place. Let the spirit of a can-do spirit be in this place, Lord. Let the Holy Spirit begin to come in in a mighty way and touch our hearts and make us what you want us to be. In Jesus' name, not just for this season, but for a lifetime. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. And God, we glorify your name. We praise you. Let's have everyone in this place begin to praise God. Begin to thank you for what he's going to do right now. Begin to thank him in advance for what he's going to do in your life. Begin to praise him with the shout of victory in your life. Begin to praise him with your own voice. Let everything that has breath begin to praise the name of the Lord. And he will do what he says. Lift him up. We praise you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus. It's a different altar call, but I just want to say, and this is what came to my mind, and, and I just want to say it. It's out of context, but it's applicable. applicable. And that is this. Weeping will endure for the night. But your joy is 
coming in the morning. You might have been weeping a long time, but your joy, that you've got to see the noonday. You've got to see the sun rising. You've got to see the morning. 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 You've got to walk by faith. And I said that to say this, that as you leave this place today, you need to go in faith, believe in God, that he can do anything, even for you. Amen? God bless you. Go in the name of the Lord.